On June the 16th, 1976, the youth stood up against apartheid and changed the political history of South Africa forever. The event became known as the Soweto Uprising, and it undoubtedly accelerated the country's progress towards an equal and democratic society. But in order to understand the uprising and its place in South Africa's fight for freedom, we have to first take a deep dive into the history of the country to the very start of colonialism. But before I start, please note that the topics discussed involved gross violations of human rights, which may be distressing to some. In 1948, the National Party came to power and swiftly implemented the infamous system known as apartheid. Meaning a partners, it brutally enforced racial segregation by empowering white citizens of Dutch and British descent and disenfranchising non-white South Africans, which included Blacks, Indians and Coloreds. Please note that the references made to the racial group of Coloreds is acceptable in South Africa and refers to a multiracial ethnic group native to the country. So what was apartheid? Well, it was a continuation of the already unjust and deeply racist system of colonization and slavery, which dates back to the 17th century. Back then, the original African inhabitants were dispossessed of most of their land and enslaved by Dutch settlers, otherwise known as the Boers. They were exploited for their labor and forced to work on farmlands. Around this time, the Dutch also imported slaves from Indonesia, Sri Lanka and Madagascar, these groups of people would eventually be known collectively as the Cape Malays, and they are considered parts of the coloured population. The Dutch were able to dominate parts of South Africa thanks to their exploitive economic practices that showed no remorse for black lives. But they gradually lost power to the British colonists in 1806. The British rapidly began dominating urban areas and taking control of finance, trade, politics, mining and manufacturing. The Dutch, on the other hand, remained largely in the rural areas. In 1834, the British abolished slavery, and this was strongly opposed by the Dutch, who at this time began resenting British rule. This resulted in the migration of thousands of Dutch-speaking families towards the interior of South Africa, away from British control. On their quest to find new land, they killed or violently drove out local populations like the Indebele and Zulu. But in order to get this land, the Dutch had a tough battle to win because the local populations always stood up to them. However, in the end, the Dutch were ruthless and had better weapons. They eventually settled in the high felt, leaving the black populations with no options but to move into more remote and less fertile areas. The Dutch claimed much of the land in this region and the British allowed them to exist as independent states as they saw little value here. But, in an incredible twist, diamonds were eventually found on these lands. And yet, in another twist, the Dutch chose to maintain a farming lifestyle instead of taking advantage of the opportunity to enrich themselves. The British, on the other hand, saw a window of opportunity and wasted no time gaining control over the region in order to exploit the natural resources. They annexed Transvaal and quickly established mines. But in 1880, the Afrikaners revolted against this control, and this resulted in the First Boer War, which took place between 1880 and 1881. The war proved to be successful for the Boers, and the British granted them independence once again. It's fair to say that South Africa was a playground for the British and Dutch to use to their advantage in any way they saw fit, and their racist attitudes justified their brutal oppression towards the black ethnicities. The discovery of diamonds and later gold in 1886 placed black South Africans in yet another cycle of exploitation as whites owned mining companies ruled using intimidation and discrimination. These companies enjoyed massive wealth while the impoverished black miners lived in abject poverty, earning below what was needed for survival for them and their families. As the mining industry boomed, the government introduced past laws which restricted the movement of non-whites in certain areas and was used to control where they lived and forced them to settle in areas that benefited the white population. These laws made it compulsory for non-whites to carry their identification papers with them at all times, as this was used to identify their race. Past laws have a long history in South Africa and also played a big role during apartheid. 
It dates back as far as 1709 during the height of slavery. Around the time gold and diamonds were discovered, South Africa also brought in indentured laborers from India, Pakistan and Bangladesh to work in the sugarcane plantations in the province of Natal and later as indentured coal miners and railway workers. The conditions they worked in were atrocious, with many dying due to disease or malnutrition. The province of Transvaal was a centre stage for the Second Boer War that took place from 1899 to 1902. This was the heartland of the Dutch, who at this point started identifying as Afrikaners. This is derived from the Dutch dialect of Afrikaans. Can you guess why this war took place? Well, it was the same reason the First Boer War took place, and that is Britain's insatiable greed for natural resources. When gold was discovered here in 1886, the British couldn't help themselves, but tried to annex Transvaal once again. The Afrikaners, on the other hand, weren't having any of it, and planned to build a rail line through Mozambique in order to shut the British out of the gold trade. This proved to be the final straw for the British, and in 1899, they moved to occupy Transvaal once and for all. The bloody conflict resulted in the British gaining control of both the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. This war was particularly brutal because the British set up concentration camps for displaced Boer families. Thousands of Boer women and children ended up dying in these camps. Another group that suffered the horrors of concentration camps were the Black population. Around 130,000 Black people were forcibly placed here as the British feared they would help the Boers during the war. These camps were rife with disease and thousands of black lives were also lost. After the war, an English-speaking population dominated and focused their attention on rebuilding the country, especially the mining industry. At this point, non-white South Africans were completely marginalized and had lost most of their political and economic independence. Rebellions and protests broke out throughout the country without much success. In 1910, things got so much worse as the British and Afrikaners put aside their differences in order to further entrench white power and privilege. This resulted in South Africa uniting for the very first time into a single nation known as the Union of South Africa. It was a British territory, but the Afrikaners were granted limited self-government in Transvaal and the Orange Free State. On the 15th of September, the Union of South Africa held its very first election and Louis Boerter was elected as the Prime Minister. The majority of Blacks, Indians and Coloreds, along with women, were denied voting rights. Under the Union of South Africa, racial segregation became the official policy and it became lawful for the white minority to have controlling power over non-whites. Not long after this, the 1913 Land Act was implemented, preventing the black population from buying, renting or using land except in the homelands. Once the act was implemented, millions lost their land and were moved to underdeveloped areas far away from urban areas, where they experienced overcrowding, land hunger, poverty and starvation. Between 1910 and 1948, a number of white-only political parties governed South Africa and laws and regulations ensured that the white population had access to the best education, higher paying jobs, property and resources. The very things that made them thrive were denied to the other races. This period not only laid the groundwork for apartheid, it also led to the formation of opposition groups. And this would eventually bring down the unjust system that so deeply entrenched itself in the country for over three centuries. The most prominent group was the African National Congress, or the ANC, which formed just two years after the Union of South Africa. It was founded by lawyer Pixley Kaseme and aimed to bring all Africans together to fight for their land and freedom. In its early years, the ANC was non-violent and adopted a peaceful approach inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. But the members soon came to realize that their calls for change were falling on deaf ears. And in the face of extreme racism and police brutality, they would eventually become more militant. You would think that with hundreds of years of racism, oppression and segregation, there would be some relief at the end of the tunnel, but that was not yet on the cards. Instead, the system that promoted white privilege and punished people of color only got more brutal. In 1948, upon the election of the National Party, racial laws and regulations were merged with political vision 
to create the system of apartheid. Apartheid was implemented at a time when the world was recovering from the horrors of World War II. The political climate shifted to one that was very against racial discrimination and the idea of racial superiority. But in South Africa, through the National Party, they bottled the evils of World War II and released it towards an already impoverished population. The National Party stood for Afrikaner nationalism and it believed that the British leaders before them were too lenient in their implementation of segregation. Now, at the helm of power, the new leaders of South Africa began clamping down on non-white groups and this was led by Prime Minister Daniel Milan and his right-hand man, Hendrik Verfoot. Although both the British government and Afrikaner government promoted racial segregation, the ideologies behind it were very different. The British were liberal. They viewed South Africa as a business transaction and their only concern was profiting from it until they no longer needed it. People of color were of little value, but they insisted that they should have rights, although this was limited and hard to identify. The Afrikaner government, on the other hand, viewed white people as the chosen ones to whom God had given South Africa. Therefore, their rights were above any other groups and this gave them access to the land and superior education, healthcare, employment and housing. As a result, racism took on a new meaning based on doctrine, faith and fanaticism. They could dominate the other racial groups with little regard for human rights as this was their divine right. Under apartheid, a rigid hierarchy was implemented where the white population stood at the pinnacle, the black population stood at the very bottom, and the Indian and colored groups were ranked above the black population. Because the black population made up an overwhelming majority in South Africa, the ruling government believed they had to keep them in check by placing them in absolute poverty. They had no voting rights, were not allowed to move around freely, could not buy land, and were not allowed to participate freely in the economy. Indians and coloreds were also severely oppressed, but they were allowed some employment and mobility privileges. This rigid hierarchy not only served the white population, it also created division and hatred among non-white races. Thus, apartheid could thrive further through a divide and conquer approach based on emotional lines, not just geographical ones. In the 1950s, the government's dream of racial segregation was coming together through a number of laws that, to this day, have an impact on South Africans in one way or another. The cornerstone of this segregation was the Group Areas Act, which banned mixed-race residential and business areas. This was done by physically separating each race into areas set aside for their racial group. Once an area was declared a group area, the government would demolish all the houses that existed there and displace anyone who was not part of the designated group. The best areas were reserved for the white population and the worst possible areas were reserved for the black population. More than 600,000 blacks, Indians and coloreds were removed from their homes in areas classified for white occupation. Past laws played a pivotal role in South Africa and by the time apartheid rolled in, it became an essential tool for segregation. It required black South Africans over the age of 16 to carry a passbook at all times and this severely limited their movement. Forgetting to carry the past, losing it or having it stolen resulted in arrests and imprisonment. It quickly became the most hated symbol of apartheid. If we were to step into South Africa around 70 years ago, we would see scenes like these. This is because the act legalized the racial segregation of public premises vehicles and services. The best facilities were reserved for the white population. The Bantu Education Act brought African education under the control of the government and it extended apartheid into black schools. Previously, these schools were run by missionaries, but the act took this independence away. It ultimately became the focal point of the Soweto uprising in 1976. As long as the government kept dishing out unjust laws, the oppressed continued to protest and fight for their rights. And eventually, the fight against apartheid became a multiracial one, with all races adding their voices to the struggle, including those who directly benefited from it. <laughs>
Throughout history, South Africa has witnessed the tenacity of the brave as they stood up against 300 years of oppression, even in the face of police brutality and immense loss of life. The Defiance Campaign in 1952, the Women's March in 1956, the Shawful Massacre in 1960, and the Wildcat Strikes between 1973 and 74 taught the nation that their voices mattered and that they could make a change. Through these protests, great leaders were born, such as Nelson Mandela, Chris Hani, Yusuf Dadu, Lillian Ngoyi, Walter Sisulu, and Dennis Goldberg. These protests also played a big part in inspiring the youth to take action on June the 16th, and this ultimately became a key moment in the fight for freedom. The winds of change were sweeping across the country, and this time, the youth were leading the way. They were following in the footsteps of those before them, but things were different this time around, and a new dawn was on the horizon. On that morning, around 10 to 20,000 school children took to the streets in the township of Soweto to protest the introduction of Afrikaans as a language of instruction. This was in response to the Afrikaans Medium Decree of 1974, which forced all black schools to use the language of Afrikaans to teach mathematics and social studies. They also had enough of Bantu education, which upheld an inferior and unequal system of education. Before this, Black schools used English and the indigenous language as a medium of instruction and bypassed Afrikaans altogether because of its association with apartheid and oppression. They also didn't understand the language and feared they would fail the upcoming exams. But after the decree, English remained the language of instruction for general science and practical subjects. This meant that black schools now had to be taught in a 50-50 mix of two languages, both of which were foreign to them. The Soweto uprising was inspired by a similar but smaller protest in the township that took place two months earlier and involved the students at Orlando West Junior School. After the initial protest, students from schools around Soweto were driven to take further action and planned a meeting on June the 13th to discuss what needed to be done to aid their campaign. At the meeting, they established an action committee named the Soweto Students' Representative Council and this is where the idea for a mass rally for June the 16th was born. Little did they know, this rally would eventually play a key role in bringing a party to an end, but also cause bloodshed along the way. On the morning of June the 16th, the students gathered at the respective schools where teachers and anti-apartheid movements asked for a calm and controlled demonstration. The students then began walking to the Orlando Stadium. Inspired by black consciousness movements and hungry for equality, they marched peacefully, singing struggle songs and carrying signs saying down with Afrikaans and Afrikaans is the oppressor's language. On the way to the stadium, the students realized that police barricaded the route they were on, so they used an alternate one. However, as they marched on, tragedy struck, and police fired tear gas and later live ammunition on the demonstrating students. They never made it to the Orlando Stadium. Protests lasted for the next 10 days and resulted in 176 deaths and over 1,200 injuries. Although it is believed that the actual estimates are much higher, with deaths totaling around 575 people, the shootings in Soweto sparked a massive uprising across more than 100 urban and rural areas in South Africa, and the ripple effects of the uprising lasted for about a year. For most South Africans, the picture that best represents the horrors of apartheid is of Hector Peterson's body being carried away from the protest. He was the first casualty of the Soweto uprising, and his death undoubtedly showed the world, the real South Africa, under the apartheid regime. His picture was splashed in newspapers across the world, and this began a worldwide lobbying for the imposition of economic sanctions on the country. It took more than 18 years after the uprising to bring the apartheid regime to its knees and welcome a new democratic South Africa under the leadership of Nelson Mandela, who was released from prison in 1990. Without a doubt, the brave youth that stood up to an unjust system in 1976 helped accelerate the process 
towards a fair and equal society. It is them we celebrate every year on June the 16th.